world. This is Rick Levine with your October forecast. It's hard to believe that it's October already. And here in the United States, that means we're just barely a month away from the presidential election. And so I imagine that October is going to be a pretty intense and crazy month regardless of the astrology, but the astrology does back that up. We'll get there in just a moment. First of all, I would like to announce our monthly winner. As many of you know, that anyone who's on the mailing list is eligible for a monthly drawing that we do. And that monthly drawing is for a free mini reading of your natal chart and the harmonic aspects that are in the natal chart. And each month we pick a winner from my email list. If you're not on the list, you can go to www.ricklevineastrologer.com and you can sign up for the mailing list there. Uh, Each month, Gail, actually my assistant, uh, uses a program that selects at random one person from the mailing list. And that program picks out a random number that then is associated with the winner. This month's winner, the number was 5936. And that person is Charles DeBetta. And Charles, you'll receive an email from us um, shortly, and we will make sure that you get your reading scheduled. And I look forward to uh, talking with you online. We do that the first of every month. So if you're not on the mailing list, on the email list, do that. I promise you won't be overwhelmed by a lot of marketing emails, and we will not ever sell that name or give that name of that list away to anyone else. So, Uh, Just a couple of quick things before we get into the forecast. Um, First of all, I want to mention that on Friday night, October 4th, I will be back at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. Last month, we broadcast, I broadcast uh, from uh, Sussex, England. But uh, for those of you in the Seattle area, uh, we will be at Soul Food Coffee House at 6.30 p.m. We will start, and that's on Friday evening. I will also be there on the first Friday night of November, November 1st, Um, and in December, I will not be there and will be broadcasting from India, and I will be back in January. So that's basically what's going on for Astrology Night. For those of you not in the area, you can go to my uh, um, YouTube channel and you can watch the Astrology Night broadcast uh, on the live stream or you can watch it afterwards. Okay, that's number one. Um, A couple of very quick things. On uh, Friday, late Friday night, actually very early Saturday morning, I will be doing the opening lecture for the Mayo School of Astrology. Uh, They're doing their annual online conference, and um, my talk will begin, (laughs) if you're Pacific time, it's 2 a.m. on Saturday uh, morning, and that is Saturday, October 5th. Uh, If you're in England, where the school is actually located, um, that'll be at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning, and I'll be joining a host of other astrologers, including Rick Tarnas, Wade Caves, Kay Taylor, Brian Clark, uh, um, uh, Christine Skinner, Wendy Stacy, and so uh, the link will be in the um, first pinned comments Uh, Below, there'll be links to all the things that I mention here um, uh, in this introduction. Secondly, this same weekend, it's a busy weekend for me, Astrology Night on Friday night, then the Mayo School Talk early Saturday morning. On Sunday at noon, and all times that I give are Pacific time, Sunday at noon I'll be doing an ESAR, that's the International Society for Astrological Research, I'll be doing an ESAR Star Club webinar, and that it's entitled Applying the Magic of Harmonic Aspects. Uh, If you are an ESAR member, these uh, talks are free. If you're not, there's a minimal charge. Um, That'll be on October 6th, Sunday at noon, and uh, it'll be about an hour and a half lecture. And again, the link will be um, in, in the comments below. Then, mid-October, October October 16th through 21st, 
I will be in Park City, Utah at the OPA retreat. Um, I believe you can still sign up, but I think that that's pretty full already. Um, but uh, again, the link for that will be down below also. And that conference is titled Awakening celebrating the Aquarian shift. There'll be a day of plenary talks, and then there'll be small group immersions. I look forward to seeing many of you there. That's October 16th through 21 in Park City, Utah, up in the hills, mountains outside of Salt Lake City. Then, and this one is still quite active, on November 23rd through December 4th, I will be doing my initiation into astrology in Goa, India. This is the south end of Goa. It's a beautiful, magical place. It's an Ayurvedic healing spa. I know I've been talking about this for quite a while. Um, I did a, a retreat at the same place a year ago. This will actually be my third time at the same place. It's a very magical place, just a short walk down to a very beautiful, uh, swimmable beach on the Arabian Sea. Um, this is 12 days of a full immersion into the astrological experience in the absolutely beautiful, magical, spiritual um, side of India in Goa. Um, good restaurants, good food, everything's taken care of, though, from the time you get off the plane to the time you get back on the plane. Um, this will be my 13th or 14th workshop with Heaven and Earth Workshops. Um, and basically, these 12 days will combine pretty much the best of all my previous teachings. Uh, full daily curriculum, daily activities on the heavenandearthsworkshop.com um, website. And again, the link will also be down below. And if you're interested in that or have any questions, please feel free to contact me directly. Um, it's a small group. Um, there'll be probably about 20 of us in that range. Um, and there is room for a few more people. So if you're interested, now is the time. It's getting close enough that um, that in next month it'll be too late. So um, yeah, look into that if you are interested. Then, just a couple of quick things in calendar year 2025. I will be attending and speaking at Convergence 2025. This is in Orlando, Florida. Um, it, this is the Cosmic Patterns Astrology Conference. It'll be March 7th, 8th, and 9th in Orlando, Florida. There'll be 24 um, world-renowned astrologers. I feel very privileged to be amongst this group. That includes uh, people like Owner Dozier from um, Istanbul and um, and Dr. Leah um, Imseragic and Alexander Imseragic from Serbia, uh, Demetra George, Ray Merriman, Ann Orderly, Joan Petrie, Kathy Rose, Christine Skinner, Georgia Stathis, and more. It's an incredible group of people, and there'll be talks uh, on uh, astrology, healing, evolutionary astrology, financial, vibrational, harmonic, um, and uh, complete information at CosmicPatternsConference.com. Again, the link is down below. Uh, the first weekend in um, the first weekend in May, actually, it'll be May 9th through the 12th. I'll be speaking at the Portuguese conference. This is the fourth, their fourth International Astrology Congress. This is entitled The Age of Change. Um, lectures here will be both in English and Portuguese. This is actually the largest Portuguese language um, conference, and um, this will be in Porto, Portugal. I'll be joining some English-speaking astrologers, including Carol Taylor from England, David Perloff, Lee Lehman, Margaret Gray from Ireland, Rod Chang, Wendy Stacy, another British astrologer, along with Alex Trenoweth, um, and a whole host of uh, Portuguese-speaking astrologers. Uh, I look forward to seeing some of you there. This will be my um, third Portuguese conference, and um, they're a lot of fun. Um, so I hope to see some of you, some of you there. Uh, those are some of the upcoming things that are on my calendar. Thank you for this opportunity to share these with you. And now on 
to the astrology of October. We will begin by looking at the chart for October 1st, just as a matter of uh, information. All charts that I am doing are being done for noon Pacific Daylight Time. I use an Aries rising chart, which means that there's no ascendant, midheaven, or any Um, houses that can be used because your location on the planet will be different than mine, and yet all aspects are true and exact. And so, for example, here at the chart we're looking at for October 1st, uh, the moon is at 28 degrees of Virgo, uh, and that will be true for you wherever you are on the planet if you adjust to your local time zone. In fact, at noon today, and whenever I use the word today, I will be referring to the chart that's in front of us. The only charts that we'll be looking at that were not that will not be for noon will be the charts for the new moon and full moon. Um, the new moon, of course, uh, tomorrow on October 2nd is a solar eclipse, and we will be looking at that chart in just a moment. But uh, just make sure that you understand that all aspects are exact at the right times. And uh, sometimes I'll refer to a chart and I'll talk about the moon having moved into a sign, but it may not do it until four or five o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening. So the chart that we're looking at for noon might still show it in the previous sign. So just be aware that all charts that we're looking at except for the lunations, will be for noon. So that having been said, um, this is an interesting month because we're beginning to get a flavor of planets turning direct. We've had a whole swing of planets over the last few months that have gone retrograde, including uh, Pluto, which is now backed up into uh, Capricorn. You can see here that on October 1st, Pluto is at 29 degrees and 40 minutes of um, of Capricorn. Uh, Pluto will turn direct on October 11th, but it's not moving very fast because by the end of the month, Pluto is only at 29 degrees and 46 minutes, meaning that Pluto will barely move one-tenth of a degree through the entire month. So for all practical purposes, even though Pluto will be turning direct this month, for all practical purposes, it's pretty much stationary all, all month. Um, But so Pluto is one of the planets that will be turning direct this month. Um, Saturn has also uh, turned retrograde. It's retrograde. Neptune is retrograde. Chiron is retrograde. Um, uh, Uranus is retrograde. And Jupiter being the um, holdout, uh, Jupiter actually turns retrograde on October 9th. And for that reason, Jupiter doesn't move much this month either, because we begin the month with Jupiter at 21 degrees, 21 degrees and 15 minutes um, of Gemini. And we end the month with Jupiter just at 20 degrees of Gemini, barely having backed up at all. So, Between Pluto and Jupiter, there's not much movement in these outer planets, and that's really important. Meanwhile, the inner planets are all moving pretty quickly. Um, Mercury, having just had its Kazemi with the Sun, um, its Kazemi meaning lined up with the, conjoined with the Sun, um, Mercury's moving rather quickly right now, so is Venus. Mars is moving quickly right now, but it begins to slow down because we're actually coming into a Mars retrograde. Mars doesn't turn retrograde until December 6th. But by mid-November, Mars will be slowing down pretty pretty rapidly. Um, but for all practical purposes, Mercury, Venus, and Mars right now are moving quickly enough that they're all making aspects, and it feels like things are really moving ahead, um, and yet there's still this sluggish energy from the outer planets, in particular Jupiter turning retrograde, um, and Pluto basically being stationed for, for much of the month. So 
here we oh and and also before i get into the day by day charts um i just also want to mention um that mercury changes signs we begin the month with mercury in libra and mercury enters scorpio on october 13th we'll have more to say about that in a few minutes um, and Venus, which we begin the month with Venus in Scorpio, Venus will move into Sagittarius on the 17th. So we're getting a flavor of both Venus and Mercury and Venus being ahead of the sun, kind of pushing into new territory, meaning that our intellect, our, our information, Mercury um, and Venus, what it is that we like, they're both anticipating the future. They're both moving ahead. Um, and the sun, of course, changes signs uh, uh, around well actually on October on October 22nd it moves from Libra where it is now into um, into uh, Scorpio um, one other thing and that is as I mentioned we have the um, new moon the Libra new moon which is a solar eclipse tomorrow on October 2nd and um, and we also have uh, the Aries full moon on October 17th. And we'll drill down on both of those charts in just a few minutes. So as we look at the chart for October 1st, um, w there's a couple of things that stand out. First of all, the moon at latter degrees of Virgo midday means that the moon will be shifting um, into, um, uh, into Libra. and That will be on Tuesday, October 1st, um, and it will do that at 3.19 p.m., while the moon is at the very end of Virgo, though, it's whizzing through a pattern that has already been made over the past week or so by both Mercury and the sun, as both Mercury and the sun actually over the past 10, 11 days, as each of them moved from Virgo into Libra. And as they did, they each made a trine with um, Uranus, as the moon will do this morning on October um, 1st. May, each of them made a trine with Uranus, then an opposition with Neptune. Uh, the trine with Uranus kind of is exciting and there's potential for change. The opposition to Neptune is a bit fuzzy and like what's going on. It may be a bit spiritual, but it also can be a bit confusing or even delusional. And then the moon will make a trine to um, Pluto, um, and that'll be just after noon today before the moon then moves into uh, Libra at 3.19 p.m. And so we have this grand trine energy in Earth um, cooking, but the moon moving into Libra kind of really sets in tone a larger um, issue for the month, and that is that this air energy is beginning to take over, and we're getting this air energy in a number of ways that are setting the tone for the years to come. Um, obviously, the moon and and uh, the Sun and Mercury all being in Libra by tomorrow, by, by the uh, new moon, and Jupiter in Gemini, that's all air, that's all air energy. But the other piece, though, is that we have, as Pluto turns direct, Pluto will move back into Aquarius on November uh, 19th where it will then stay for a couple of decades. And on top of that, um, Uranus will be moving into um, out of Taurus and into Gemini, and it will do that in July of 2025. And so these slower-moving outer planets of um, Uranus and Pluto moving from Earth into air is going to be a, a primary issue over the years to come. And we're getting a little microcosmic kind of you know flavor of this as the moon moves from uh, from uh, Virgo into uh, Libra with both the Sun and Mercury and even the south node in, in Libra also. Um, that is the the first, but let's move ahead to the second, and let's actually look at the chart for um, just before noon, because the actual uh, 
new moon itself, which is the new moon eclipse. This is a solar eclipse at 10 degrees of, of Libra. It's actually 10 degrees and, and four minutes of, of Libra, um, is a very important new moon because we still have the moon and the sun conjoining Mercury. Remember, that was a Kazemi that was actually exact um, on September 30th, but now we have this new moon at 10 degrees with the moon with Mercury at um, 11 degrees, and so there is a function of communication that's very important here. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, this solar eclipse is a south node eclipse, meaning that it is connecting with the um, descending node, which is often related to issues of the past rather than the future. This new moon eclipse is a square and a half, a sesquisquare or sesquiquadrant to Uranus, which is actually a motivational um, aspect. It's something that can you know, kick up a storm. And it's important to understand that there's some surprises here at this eclipse. And remember, eclipses aren't just about the singular day that they occur. Eclipses set in motion kind of a vortex in, in in it's almost like a time tunnel where where things up to six months prior and six months after the eclipse are still related to that energy. And so we have a high level of change here and yet there is a also a deep connection with communication that is done toward a diplomatic interest or an interest of negotiation or finding equilibrium. Remember, Libra is not the sign of balance. It's the sign of seeking balance, which means that things can be quite out of whack. Remember, Libra is a strategic sign. It's, it's basically wanting to figure out ways in which it can put these things that are not in balance back in balance. And that's what it seeks to do, whether it does it to, through diplomatic actions or through counseling actions um, or even strategic actions on a chessboard or on a battlefield. Um, Libra has to do with negotiation. It's the aspect of relationship. And both the solar eclipse on October 2nd and the, um, the Aries full moon um, on October 17th are both basically relating to this balance of self and other. There's two sides to every coin, and although the Aries energy just says, uh, this side only, I, me, mine, that when we bring Libra into the equation, instead of it being about me, it's about we. It, there, there's this inclusion of self and other and a seeking to find balance. Another important thing about this um, about this um, eclipse is that we also are coming off of an exact trine between Mars and Saturn that was also exact the end of September, um, but it's still here at the time of the eclipse itself. Um, the Saturn-Mars trine is only about a degree and a half away from being exact. And into this, we have Venus moving into a trine, first with Saturn and then, um, and then with Mars. And it's important uh, it's important to understand that the the um, the trines from Venus w are not exact yet. In fact, um, Venus trines Saturn on October fourth, and it trines Mars on October eighth. But we're already feeling it at the time of this eclipse, and the reason is that the eclipse in Libra is ruled by or is associated with Venus, Venus being at home in Libra. And so we look at Venus, and Venus is part of this um, forming into this, applying into this grand water trine with Venus in Scorpio, where Venus is not at home. In fact, Venus is other sign that it's at home um, in a Aside from Libra is Taurus, and Scorpio being opposite to Taurus means that Venus is in its exile. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's in its detriment. It's not happy because it's so far away from home, and yet it doesn't make Venus 
bad or wrong. It just makes it more difficult to figure out how to use the intensity and the power and the passion of desiring things that are so intense with Venus in Scorpio, but that Venus is cooled a bit by its coming trine to Saturn, and yet it's activated a bit by its trine to Mars. So we're getting that Venus energy all through the beginning of, um, of, of, of the month. We also have another thing that's still uh, two things that are that are left over um, that that were building or came to a culmination last month or are still building. And those two things are number one, we had the Saturn half square to Pluto on September 25th. And for those of you who um, get my mid-month update through Patreon, remember that's three dollars a month, and you can go to, you can go to Patreon.com/slash Rick Levine if you want that mid-month update. But for those of you who got the September mid-month update and even the September forecast, I talked quite a bit about this Saturn half square, semi square to Pluto because it's been related to um, the conflict in particular, in general, all conflict that has to do with a reestablishment of boundaries. But in particular, it's been very associated and tied to um, the Israeli incursions as a response to the events a year ago on May, uh, on October 7th. But the first half square between uh, between Saturn and Pluto was on May 6th, which was the um, days right around May 6th, the day, the day of and the day after when Israel's main incursion into Rafah occurred. And then there was also um, uh, air strikes on, I think, up to 14 um, uh, villages in southern Lebanon. This is back on May 6th of 2025, 2024. And I also mentioned in the September forecasts how we would likely see that firing back up, maybe bad choice of the word firing, but 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 building again, coming to another round of crescendo um, around the um, full moon eclipse in September and the actual um, culmination perfection of that semi-square um, on the September 25th. And we certainly did. First, we saw the, you know, pager slash cell phone explosions um, around the eclipse. And then we saw a major military incursion into southern Lebanon um, as Israel um, extended its uh, whatever its strategy has been um, in the um, uh, Gaza area as it's uh, eradicating and or doing whatever it's doing there. Certainly, um, I'm not adverse to using the word genocide, but we're seeing something building also again now in southern Lebanon, and we still have this influence. This is my point. As we move into October, even though we're a week away from that being exact, that's still within um, orb, the Saturn to Pluto is still less than that semi-square, is still less than a half a degree of orb. And so it's very important to understand that this is still a flavor for October. The other thing that's still, and by the way, there's a third and final um, uh, semi-square between Saturn and Pluto that will occur within the week after the presidential inauguration in uh, 2025, and that will be on January 26th, 2025. So we're not done with this Saturn-Pluto semi-square. Now, the other thing I want to mention that is also um, a, a very important aspect for the month, and because it's very close during the eclipse, I'm talking about the Jupiter sextile to Chiron. Jupiter sextile to Chiron on the day of the eclipse is less than a half a degree orb. So it's already very, very tight. It's already, um, you know, certainly, you know, uh, within, um, you know, within, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Within an area of influence, of, of impact. And the thing is, is that that aspect is exact on October 12th. But it's important to understand that the potential healing of Jupiter sextiling um, 
Chiron. This is about learning by expanding our knowledge, by expanding our areas of understanding. Jupiter is a magnifying lens that, that extends our boundaries. And in its sextile to Chiron, it has something that we can learn or things that can be taught because Chiron, remember, although we often call Chiron the wounded healer, Chiron was the original mentor. And from that standpoint, Chiron, although it may have had a wound and it uses that wound as a motivational factor for wanting to help or heal others or to teach others. And so we have a potential through the month of October of applying this energy. And although there are going to be other stresses throughout the month that will certainly complicate things, it's important to keep in mind that we also have the ability to use our awareness and our consciousness to choose healing over um, destruction, construction, production, over destruction. So that's the eclipse at the beginning of the month. And remember, another thing is that solar eclipses are often associated with a transition of power. You know, the ancient uh, edict, um, you know, long live the king, the king must die, long live the king. There's a change going on, and, and there's often a fall from power or a fall from grace. And so we might want to keep our eyes open and, and our awareness at the edge so that we can pay attention to what this larger shift is that's going on. And remember, an eclipse occurs on a day. This one occurs, the totality, you know, it's actually a partial solar eclipse, but it's most total at 11.45 a.m. Pacific time. And yet the impact will be felt for days weeks, and even months after this eclipse. And so we can watch and see how this unfolds. As we move forward um, and we look at the chart for, um, for October 3rd, on October 3rd, we have a couple of you know, um, aspects that occur. The moon is still in Libra, but it's moving away um, from the full moon, uh, from the new moon position, uh, it opposes Chiron, and so there is again this emphasis on this healing, because as the moon opposes Chiron, it's also making a trine with Jupiter. That's midday on October third. The other thing that occurs on October third is that Venus makes an exact square and a half to Neptune, so we may be attracted to or desire something that is very much in the realms of imagination or spiritual, and yet I think this uh, um, energy of the moon and Chiron again gives us a chance to find ways in which to create healing. By October um, 4th, and, and, and on the 4th we have the moon moving into Scorpio, and that occurs on Friday morning at 4.22 a.m. Um, so the moon in Scorpio is a bit more potent. Um, it's a bit more observable. It's a bit more intense. It, it it's, doesn't give us as much leeway for kind of like, let's figure out a way to be nice in all this. We still have Mercury um, and the Sun back in Libra, of course, but with the Moon in Scorpio, we might be a bit more emotionally volatile, whether or not we express that volatility on the surface, especially because we also have Venus moving into an exact trine with Saturn today, which... I I mentioned earlier on, because Venus moving into a trine with Saturn today on October 4th, and then perfecting its trine with, um, with Mars on October 8th, and Mars still within orb of its trine to Saturn, um, that was exact the end of September, we have this sense of being able to organize, of being, um, having a sense of, 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 of applying our physical energy. Mars in Cancer may not be very outgoing at least in appearance, but it's using its energy cautiously and carefully. And in that trine to Saturn, it's applying it to things that are real. And with Venus's trine to Saturn, it's very likely 
that um, that we know what we want and we have a way in which we're willing to wait to get what we want in order to to accomplish something or to get or, or to um, uh, um, accomplish not so much accomplishment it's more like realizing or 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 achieving some sort of pleasure gratification something sweet something Venusian and and we're willing to set aside immediate gratification for something that is longer term. And especially because that Venus is coming into a trine with Mars, I think we can see these days as having some potential in relationship um, or in relationships. Although I must say um, that we also have the sun making a square and a half to Uranus, which I mentioned at the time of the eclipse itself, because the moon and the sun, I said, were, you know, sesqui square or a square and a half to Uranus, which can be a bit upsetting or a bit kind of radical. Um, something can certainly happen. Something can happen. And note that we also have Mercury coming into a square with Mars. That's exact tomorrow on the 5th. But this can be words that that create um, assertion or aggression that can be overextended, that can turn into a bit of a of an ego, you know, kind of battle or or a conflict of some sort. Um, and so this is all part of the day. Let's actually move ahead um, to the fifth. We can see that at noon on the fifth, the moon is still in Scorpio. In fact, the moon is caught up to Venus, and Venus is just past its trine to Saturn now, but still coming into its trine to Mars. And so there can be some sweet emotional energy here. However, the caveat is that Mercury has moved closer to its square um, to Mars, which is exact late tonight. In fact, the Mercury square Mars is exact at 11.36 p.m. Mercury is moving pretty quickly right now, but we need to be careful about about what we say, because what we say can stir up a problem, and that problem may be resolvable because we still have Venus coming into a trine with Mars, and so I think it's a matter of of being aware that we can say what needs to be said if we do it in a sweet and Venusian way that considers what another person's position or feelings um, is, what another person's feelings are. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, it does no use at all to just stir things up without any, um, without making any progress towards what we're doing. Um, and yet that Mercury square Mars has the propensity to do, do that. That, um, on Saturday the fifth and on into um, and on into the the, the sixth. Incidentally, um, on the sixth, the moon will move into Sagittarius. Um, we show at noon on the sixth, on Sunday the sixth, the moon is still in Scorpio, but it's at um, almost twenty. It's twenty-seven, almost twenty-eight degrees, and so by um, by uh, what time? By four thirty-four p.m., the moon moves from Scorpio into Sagittarius, which can be a bit uplifting. We also have Venus making the trine to Mars, and so there's a bit of sweet energy in the air. Um, also, before the moon changes signs, while the moon is still midday um, in late degrees of Scorpio. It's making a trine with Neptune. I think here the energy is um, is easier than it is difficult. Um, we the 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 sun is um, past its quincunx with um, with Saturn. Well, that's exact very early in in well midday early in the day, and so there can be some oh how to say this there can be some difficulty with authority, but I think that it's more of a an annoying problem rather than one that's insurmountable, but we still need to be careful about overamping that Mars or about holding in anger and resentment and not expressing it in some way that allows us to move through that energy um, because Mars in Cancer has the uh, propensity um, to hold on to anger or even rage and then have it leak out in ways that are not actually productive at all. Um, that's the um, the sixth. 
On the seventh, with the moon moving through Sagittarius, um, we might feel a bit more uplifting energy. Venus coming in even closer to its trine to Mars. Um, we'll move to the eighth, and we can see now that Venus um, is by degree midday just past its trine to Mars. It makes the exact trine at 3:21 a.m. Um, on the eighth. But we also have another trine today from Mercury, making a trine to Jupiter, and this is really interesting. Remember, we began the month with the moon moving through that position where the moon was um, opposing Chiron and trining um, Jupiter. Now, with Mercury doing that same, we have an awareness about um, someone's wounds, about the hurt, or about the um, you know potential um, negativity that we can focus on, but we can also overcome that because th- that Mercury is forming a trine with optimistic or opportunistic Jupiter, and even the Moon moving through Sagittarius on Tuesday the eighth by midday, the Moon is opposite Jupiter, and we actually have what's called a mystic rectangle with the Moon. Trine Chiron, Chiron sextile Jupiter, Jupiter trine from um, Mercury, and then Mercury sextile back from the Moon. And so this these two oppositions crisscross in a way that I think gives us a strong opportunity for doing something positive, doing something good, doing something healthy, doing something healing. Um, I like the energy of this day. There is an optimism about it as long as we don't lose sight of reality completely. That is Tuesday, October 8th. We also have Jupiter, which has now slowed down. It's pretty much stationary. Technically, by the 9th, Jupiter is technically retrograde. But the fact of the matter is that Jupiter um, was at 29 degrees and 20 minutes on Sunday the 6th. And it stays at that same degree and minute all the way through Friday the 11th. So even though technically Jupiter turns retrograde here on October 9th, the fact of the matter is that Jupiter ain't moving very much right now. And it's so close to its sextile to Chiron that it's important. I mean, it, it, it's like six minutes of arc. Remember, that sextile to Chiron is exact on the 12th. And this really strengthens the opportunity to heal, the opportunity to, to learn, to grow, to expand our ways of thinking, to, to widen our perspective. And all of these things have healing potential. Often, healing occurs when we can see someone else's point of view, even if we don't agree with them. If we can feel someone's pain, even if it isn't our own, that's called compassion. Um, And so the um, Jupiter sextile to Chiron that I talked about at the very beginning and said would be active all month, right now with Mercury moving through the opposition to Chiron um, and the the trine to Jupiter, um, I think is very, very important. Um, And in fact, we'll get another bounce on this um, uh, later in the week as the sun um, makes its opposition to Chiron on the 13th and its um, trine to Jupiter. So we're in this phase right now for about a week of having great potential for healing if we can pay attention to it and if we can do something positive with that energy. When we get to the, um, the, 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 oh, also on the 9th, we have the moon moving in, um, into Capricorn, and the moon moves into Capricorn at 2.38 a.m., so we can see here on the 9th that the moon is already at four or five, almost five degrees of Capricorn. Um, it's late four degrees and 59 minutes or so of Capricorn, um, but we may be feeling a bit more what's the right word? Sober. A bit more, and I don't mean whether you're drinking or not, I just mean a bit more serious, a bit more kind of like methodical about getting things done rather than coming off of that moon in Sagittarius where everything seemed possible. Now we might be a bit more cautious about what we do with our energy. On the 10th, Venus reaches... um, 
um, no, yeah, Venus re reaches a point where it's making um, a uh, pair of quincunxes. And remember, a quincunx, really, it's quincunx, because unx is Latin for 12 quinc five twelfths, five twelfths of a, a circle. And this is a um, significant aspect that has to do with adjustment. It has to do with the inability to create resolution because you can't quite bring the problem into full focus. And yet, when a planet, in this case Venus, makes two quincunxes simultaneous, simultaneously, um, here Venus is making a quincunx from 21 degrees of Scorpio to Chiron at 21 degrees of Aries, and at the same time making a quincunx to Jupiter at 21 degrees of Gemini. Remember, Jupiter and Chiron are, um, are sextile, and they're inching closer and closer together. Um, today on October 10th, they're three minutes of arc from being exact. That's one twentieth of a degree. That is like ridiculously close. And Venus forming mutual quincunxes with both of those planets, both um, Jupiter and Chiron, creates what we call a yod or a finger of God. And this is an interesting aspect because it takes those two annoying quincunx aspects and it says, if I can combine the energy at the sextile side of this three-planet configuration, if I can somehow bring that optimism and the and the into the cooperation the sextile with Chiron the healing the wounds that can be salved that can be remedied that I can do that through intensity through passion through the desire for finding that sweetness and I can do that because we still have the sun and mercury um, in Venus's home sign of, of, of Libra. Um, and so I think this is a very important potential period of time. And, um, and yet, because they're quincunxes, we theoretically can blow it because quincunxes are easy to, me to mess up. Now, we also have Mercury coming into a quincunx with Uranus. Um, that's exact here on the 11th. Um, the 11th, this whole period of time is like transitional, but there, it, because the quincunx from Mercury to Uranus um, is really, it can be very difficult. Mercury has also just made a quincunx not only to Mercury, but it's on its way to making a quincunx to Neptune. The Mercury quincunx Neptune is not exact until tomorrow. But this is because we have Uranus and um, Uranus and Neptune making a sextile, and so now we have Mercury making that same finger of God um, configuration that Venus did with Jupiter and Chiron at the base. Now Mercury is doing it with Uranus and Neptune at the base. And this is very unusual to have two such tight, such strong um, yods or fingers of God that in some ways are bringing out the energy um, of um, Venus and Mercury at the same time that's complicated. This is not easy, but there's potential here to really resolve some things and do something with it because of the um, base energies, the, I say the, the energies at the base of these two uh, isosceles triangles, these two, quinc uh, uh, these two quincunx yods, um, the Jupiter Chiron um, at the base which is now that Jupiter Chiron on the 11th is one minute, one sixtieth of a degree from being exact. Um, the Uranus Neptune um, is a little bit wider, but that's about one and a third degrees um, from being exact. Um, but this is a very interesting period of time. The other thing that's important at this time is that um, Pluto, which remember, Pluto had moved into Aquarius, it backed into um, uh, Capricorn, and 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 it retrograded back into Capricorn for just a short little visit. Now Pluto in Capricorn is turning direct; it's stationary. And again, Pluto does not move very fast. In fact, we can go back to um, we can go back to October third when Pluto was at 29 degrees and 39 minutes, and Pluto is still at 29 degrees and 39 minutes on October 20th. 
Plu- on October 19th, actually, um, it doesn't move one sixtieth of a degree in that entire period of time. Nevertheless, technically, here on the 11th is the day that Pluto actually um, changes from retrograde to direct. And we also have had at the same time um, the moon going over, crossing over Pluto, because the moon moved on the, um, on the 11th, on the uh, morning of, of today, the 11th on Friday, um, the moon moved into Aquarius. And it did that at 9.31 a.m., which means that this morning um, at about, uh, about, probably at about 8.30-ish, I don't have the exact time, but the moon actually lined up with Pluto, and that can be a bit of, of, of intensity, but the moon moving across Pluto and into Aquarius in a way is, again, it's foreshadowing Pluto moving from Capricorn into Aquarius, like the moon just moved from Capricorn into Aquarius. Pluto will make that same movement, but Pluto won't make that movement in um, Pluto will make that movement on November 19th. And so we're getting flavors, glimpses of what's to come ahead. We move ahead to the um, to the twelfth, and on the twelfth we have the exact perfection of the Jupiter sextile Chiron that I've been talking about since the beginning of the month. I actually talked about it um, in the uh, mid month update for. Um, for September. And so this is an ongoing energy, but it actually is perfected today. And the interesting thing about this perfection today is that we have the sun coming into an opposition with Chiron that's not exact until tomorrow, um, but it's within a degree. And we also have Mars coming into a square. We're going to talk about that configuration um, a bit more in, in, in a moment. But I do want to um, mention that today um, on the 12th, um, we also have Mercury making the exact quincunx to Neptune. Remember, Mercury made the quincunx to Uranus um, yesterday, uh, making that yod, and so we still have that playing out. So Mercury is accentuated. How do we speak? How do we think? How do we listen? How do we use our logic to find harmony where perhaps there is none, at least apparently? Apparently. Um, on the 13th, we have the sun um, st- still moving closer to its opposition to Chiron, but we also have Mercury now moving into an exact square with Pluto. Now, we also had yesterday Mercury making a square and a half with Saturn. I, I didn't mention that because um, there's only so many aspects I can bring into one of these talks, but it is significant because Mercury's square and a half to Saturn yesterday and its square to Pluto today is exacerbating the half square between Saturn and Pluto that was, remember, exact back on um, September 25th. And that Saturn-Pluto half square right now is just, it's still almost within a degree of orb. It's actually one degree and three minutes. So it's, it's like about one degree of orb. And yet as Mercury swings through on the 12th and 13th, it's square and a half uh, to um, Saturn and its square to Pluto, we can expect a round of nasty communication of things coming out into the open again. This is a delicate period of time and it's building up to the full moon and it's problematic because the sun is coming into a square with Mars that's not exact until the, tomorrow the 14th, but even here today at midday on, on, on Sunday the 13th, the sun square Mars is like, it's like a quarter of a degree of orb. It's very, very close. And this is basically about arguments. It's about conflict. It's about engagement. And it's also, I think, in some ways, it can rub salt on that wound because the sun um, is um, opposing Chiron. And in fact, Mars is coming into um, 
uh, um, that square with Chiron that's exact this afternoon um, at m- midday. It's actually exact at 1.36 p.m. And so there can be this sense of almost like an inability to avoid the conflict based upon an old habit, old wound, old behavior, bad behavior. We can overcome it, but it's important that we remember that these are not good days to be impulsive. These are good days Also, burying our energy, just hiding it, is not productive either. What's productive is being aware of our anger, coming to understanding why it's coming to the surface, and then controlling it enough so that we can do something positive with it rather than just, you know, punching someone. And I don't necessarily mean that physically, although it could be. It's also metaphysically where we can get carried away with the energy and take things too far. And of course, once we say something or once we do something, we can't undo it. You know, life does not have a control Z, you know, or an option Z where we can just undo a bad uh, behavior, Uh, especially with Mercury squaring Pluto. We may say things that, that we don't want to say. On the other hand, this is also a great opportunity for things that were hidden to come out into the open. All of this is is important. Um, And the moon also moves out of Aquarius and into Pisces just after noon. You can see here at noon, the moon is at 29 degrees of Pisces. I'm sorry, 29 degrees of Aquarius. The moon moves into Pisces at 12.55 p.m. So it's just less than an hour from the chart that we're looking at here. On Monday, October 14th, we have the moon moving through Pisces. It lines up with um, Saturn midday, and that can be a bit restrictive, especially because Saturn is still making that half square to Pluto. Um, and even though it's separating and even though it's waning, um, the Mars to, uh, I'm sorry, the Saturn um, to Pluto is still just barely over a degree of orb. And as the moon swings through that midday on Monday, um, we might have our feelings kind of really bent out of shape by whatever it is that's just recently happened, especially since today, today being October 14th, we also have the sun making that exact square to Mars. Um, And this this is difficult. But remember, the sun's opposition to Chiron, which was exact yesterday, um, uh, that sun opposition to Chiron not only has Mars at the T T square point exacerbating that energy, um, heating it up, giving us impulsive ideas of what we can do to act, whether it's wise or not. That's why yesterday I spent a bit of time talking about maybe not acting on every impulsive idea of how to resolve energy. This is stimulated even more by the fact that today on the 14th at 8.25 p.m., um, it, it, no, it was actually exact last night um, at 8.25 p.m. Um, on um, Sunday the 13th, but it'll be playing with us all day today on the 14th, and that is the sun is making an exact trine to Jupiter. Normally, we think of the sun trine Jupiter as, wow, this is optimistic, this is positive, this is good stuff. The problem is that it's encouraging, it's confident, but what's that confidence exacerbating? It might, in fact, be encouraging that impulsivity of our Mars rather than the um, more difficult route of expanding our perspective and using that Jupiter to heal the Chiron, you know, to heal, to heal, to remedy, to teach, to learn. And so this period of time is all, it's very tricky energy. We have another impulsive thing occurring on the 14th, and that is that Venus comes into an exact opposition with Uranus that is exact mid-afternoon at about 3.21 p.m., and Venus is not only making an opposition to Uranus, but it's also coming into an exact trine with Neptune that is exact tomorrow. What does this mean? This means that we're attracted, Venus, to those things which are out of the box, unique, different, exciting, um, even radical, revolutionary, rebellious. And we may be a bit idealistic 
about it with Venus coming into that trine with Neptune. Thankfully, the Moon-Saturn conjunction may subdue our energy a bit, um, but this is all this is all tricky stuff. And this tricky stuff through the 14th, the 15th here, we can see that the Venus trine um, Neptune is exact with the Moon coming through that point, the Moon actually moving from Pisces, where we've been a bit dreamy, a bit kind of maybe melancholy, a bit inwardly directed, and the Moon moves into Aries at 1.35. 4 p.m. today on Tuesday the 15th. And as it it does that, um, it will not only move into Aries, but just prior to that late morning, um, it will actually join up with Neptune while Venus is trining Neptune. And so we're getting this whole thing about Uh, about intensity of emotion and desire and maybe getting caught up in traps of where we can kind of go into these um, dark or, you know, dark places or black holes of feelings that maybe aren't bad, but they're complicated. They're not easy to work our way out of. Um, And so this is a tricky few days of energy that actually leads us to the fact that on the 15th midday, just afternoon, the moon moves from Pisces into Aries. And as it does by tomorrow, the 16th, the moon is approaching the opposition to the sun. Um, And here we are on the 16th. You can see that at midday, the moon is at 14 degrees of Aries. Um, And if we move this ahead one more day, we can also see that Venus is at the um, tail end um, of um, of Scorpio, and and by the way, I don't know if I mentioned the fact that um, back on the thirteenth on Sunday, I know I talked about the Mercury making that square with Pluto, um, but later in the day on the thirteenth, Mercury then moves from Libra into Scorpio, and for a few days we have both Mercury and Venus in Scorpio. So the intensity, the passion, the power play can become a bit more intense. And and here on the 17th, as we approach the um, full moon, and the full moon um, is at 4.26 a.m. Um, on the 17th, and looking at that chart, we can see that the moon at 24 degrees and 36 minutes of Aries, this is pretty closely conjoined to Chiron. Remember, the sun opposed Chiron just a few days ago. And so we have this this full moon um, with the sun, not only um, um, with the moon in Aries, but we also have this at a degree where Eris, and we don't, I don't talk about Eris that much here, um, but but I, I get that there's only so many things we can talk about. But what's important to understand is that the Aries full moon is closely conjoining Eris. Eris is Mars's sister. Eris is the planet of, of, of the sower, of discord, of chaos. And yet Eris also offers us the opportunity for finding a higher position of consciousness that embraces or includes the other, the opposition, that which is um, creating or that which yeah, is creating Uh, the chaos or the destruction even. And so there's potential here for breakthrough, especially because we have Mars. Remember, we've had the sun squaring Mars. We have this full moon squared Mars. Mars is moving toward an exact square with Eris. And so we have some real dangerous energy here with fantastic potential um, for breakthrough and for healing. And we also have here Venus at the last degree of Scorpio making a sextile with Pluto, which basically gives us another opportunity. Remember, um, sextiles are about cooperation and about opportunity. We just had the Venus making the trine with Neptune. Um, that that um, Venus trine Neptune was exact on the 15th, and there was the dream, the illusion, the possibility of creating um, something from our fantasy. And now as Venus 
Venus makes the sextile with Pluto, um, this becomes more real. This becomes, again, there's darkness here, there's intensity, there's, there's passion, but we're at a turning point because Venus actually makes that um, sextile with Pluto, and by noon on the 17th, um, we have Venus moving into Sagittarius, and that Venus's move into Sagittarius gives us a ray of of potential, of hope, of opportunity. Of um, and so I think that this is um, a, a really it, it's a high level of potential. We also have on the seventeenth we have Mercury making a square and a half to Jupiter, and so it's almost like the shift of Venus into Sagittarius. And Mercury square and a half with Jupiter, Jupiter being this planet of Sagittarius, we have this potential of the hope, you know, of the faith, of the of the what's going to happen. Where are we going to go with this? How are we going to work our way out of this? Um, and all of this is, I think, um, quite important and quite telling about the potential that is enclosed or that is tied up in this season. As we move to the 18th, the sun makes that exact quincunx with Uranus that Mercury did last week. Remember, Mercury was at the point, the apex of a yod with with, um, Uranus and Neptune at the base. Well, we now have Uranus and Neptune at the base, and the sun is making a quincunx with Uranus today. Um, and a uh, quincunx with Neptune um, on Sunday. Um, And so we're going to get that same kind of annoying, we've had more like double quincunxes here, these these yods that are, I, I think, are very destabilizing. They're complicated because it's almost like the problem is so close and yet we can't we can't wrap our our brain around it. We can't we can't figure out quite what to do with it and how to work with it. And here on the um, the eighteenth, with the moon having moved into Taurus, the moon actually um, moved into Taurus um, on the mo- yesterday um, midday. Um, the moon moved into Taurus at one p.m. twelve fifty nine p.m. on Thursday. But here on Friday, we have the moon moving through Taurus. Um, and this annoying <laughs> um, yod with the sun quincunxing Uranus in Taurus, it feels like something's got to break, something's got to change, but what is it and how is that going to happen? Um, this is all energy on the 18th. As we move through the 19th, we have the moon catching up Um, with Uranus midday. This can be a bit explosive, a bit sudden. Um, You can see here that the sun is right in between those two aspects, making those quincunxes both to um, the moon and Uranus on one side and Neptune on the other side. Um, This is very, very powerful, especially because the moon at the end of Taurus is also making a trine with, um, with, with, with Pluto. Um, we also have the sun coming into a square with Pluto as Mars is coming into an opposition with Pluto. This is tough. We're coming into the second half of October with a lot of complexity. Um, I, I wish I could say everything was just smooth and everything was just flowing. Um, the fact is that on Saturday, the moon, um, just afternoon, the moon moves from its trine to Pluto, which can bring a bit of resolution, but it's not easy. The moon moves from um, Taurus into Gemini. It does that at 1.07 p.m. on the 19th. And then on the 20th, the sun makes that exact quincunx with Neptune, the other side of that quincunx. Again, it's almost like, what are we doing? What, what, what can we do with this energy? It's almost like there's no wee easy way out of this, especially because the sun is now imposing on this square to Pluto that will be exact on the 22nd. But here on Sunday, um, on Sunday, the 20th, um, we have the, the um, we're feeling the pressure of the sun squaring Pluto. There's deep, intense, powerful energy, energy that's at odds with each other. It just won't go away. And the sun's quincunx to Neptune makes it impossible to see 
a route to a solution or a route to a, a solution, um, and that is on, on the 20th. The sun is also making a square and a half to Saturn, and although the Saturn-Pluto semi-square is now really beginning to wane, it's almost a degree and a half of orb, it's still you know, it's still there. It's still working. It's difficult energy around the um, transmutation that would be Pluto of boundaries, Saturn. And as the sun squares Pluto and sesquisquares um, Saturn on the 20th, we can see all these problems between boundaries kind of coming once again into our face with almost like no easy resolution. Things can get out of hand. By the 21st, um, we see that the moon moving through Sagitt- uh, the moon moving through um, Gemini um, is lining up with Jupiter. There's some potential for opportunity, um, <laughs> but um, it's not all that simple. Um, the moon actually makes a square with Neptune. Once again, it's hard to know what's going on. Um, on the 21st, Mercury is making a trine with Saturn. That is giving us a bit more reality. Mercury is really active right now. It's making a square and a half to Neptune and a trine with Saturn. This is almost like saying, um, I'm motivated to solve this right now, um, but the solution is unclear. That would be the sesquisquare um, to, to Neptune. And at the very same time, Mercury is making a trine to Saturn and it says, but I know that my logic is really sound. I know that I have a handle around this, and yet look at the sun building that square to Pluto. It's coming closer and closer. And also, on the 21st at 3.49 p.m., we have the moon moving from Gemini into Cancer. Um, This also means that the moon will Um, As it moves from Gemini um, into Cancer, we're going to perhaps feel pulling in of the energy. We may feel a bit more sensitive. The energy goes inward, but it's not easy to express the energy of that Cancer moon as easily. And this can be problematic because as the sun is still moving closer and closer to that square with Pluto, something's got to give. And What gives is on the 22nd, we have that exact square between the Sun and Pluto. It's exact at 7.15 a.m. We also have later in the day the Sun moving from Libra um, into Scorpio. That occurs at 3.14 um, uh, uh, p.m. on Tuesday, the 22nd. Um, And this is basically a shifting of the energy. We, <laughs> there's a sense of things really wanting to come together, and yet they, and yet it's hard because as we do something, it stirs up more energy that's deep, and so we may be realizing that we can't resolve everything at once. We have to look at the longer game. We have to look at what can happen, you know, in the future rather than what we do today. Because if we act toward immediate resolution today, it may create more problems than, than, than solutions. That's October 22nd. Um, by the 23rd, we can see that the moon midday is catching up with Mars. There's a bit of feisty, fiery energy here. The moon actually changes from Cancer um, um, into Leo at 10.23 p.m., and just before it does, it will oppose Pluto, um, and this is also the third quarter square, the moon coming around um, to the uh, new moon in Scorpio that will be in November. But this is, um, again, a bit of complexity, a bit of intensity um, on the 23rd. By the 24th, we have Mars now making its sextile with Uranus. We've probably been feeling this for a day or two coming, but we can feel the energy here ready to release. Mars is not only making a sextile to Uranus, Mars is coming into a trine with Neptune that's not exact until the 28th. And so Mars now is kind of, um, it's transitioning from Cancer into um, Leo. Mars doesn't reach its entry into Leo 
um, until um, until next month, actually, on November 4th. But Mars is being very active right now. And by the 24th, as it sextiles Uranus, this is a day for action. This is a day to do some things, whatever those things might be, um, especially because with the moon in Leo, we're tending to act, we're tending to act out things. In fact, midday, the moon in Leo is making a trine with Venus and Sagittarius. We may have a sense of hope and a sense of what the potential is, where we can go with all of this. That's on the 24th. As we move ahead, um, the 20. Fifth, we can see um, Mars is still, um, you know, it's close. It's still making that sextile um, with Uranus that even though it was exact yesterday, um, Mars is beginning to slow down now. It's not, I mean, it, it, remember, Mars turns retrograde in another month. And so Mars is still holding that sextile to Uranus where anything can happen. It's still one third of a degree, um, you know, we, of orb. And so it's still close enough where things can happen. But Mars is also inching closer to the trine with Neptune that's exact on the 28th. And so we can act either through a higher spiritual cause, Mars trying Neptune, or we can act in a delusionary manner without really thinking about what is real. That's the 25th. Um, by the 26th, we have Mercury now moving through the other Yod position that Venus did earlier. Mercury is now making a quincunx with both Jupiter and Chiron. Remember that Jupiter Chiron um, uh, sextile, um, you know, it was already exact earlier in the month, but even now the Jupiter Chiron um, sextile is still. 10 minutes of orb from being exact. It's still one sixth of a degree. So Mercury makes these two quincunxes. Um, it makes the first with, um, with Chiron at 11.24 p.m. tonight on the 26th, and then it makes the quincunx with Jupiter tomorrow morning um, at 1.50 a.m. I'm actually going to move this ahead um, to the 27th, and we can see that Mercury now is just slightly past those degrees by noon, but this quincunx um, to Jupiter and Chiron again exacerbate the potential for healing but also exacerbate the complexity um, and the annoyance of not being able to be Mm, to, it's like when we try to say something, it may be misinterpreted. We have to be really cautious about how we express ourselves. Also notice that Mars is um, now sextiling to, uh, it's still sextiling um, to Uranus. Um, the Mars sextile Uranus is now just slightly over a degree orb, but the Mars trine to Neptune is now um, less than a third of a degree. It's 18 minutes of orb, and that's exact tomorrow on the 28th. As the moon now is moving through Virgo, the moon is exacerbating um, and applying Venus square Saturn. The Venus square Saturn is exact tomorrow on the 28th, but the moon moving through mid, um, mid Virgo opposes, uh, squares Venus and opposes Saturn. Um, the Venus is also um, making a sesqui square um, down to Mars. This is a nasty, difficult, complex energy. The saving grace is that Mars is making that harmonious trine to Neptune and still waning off of the sextile to Uranus. Hopefully, we can hold that energy in and not be impulsive because there's a lot of energy here that's right on the edge and, and things can happen. The Venus-Saturn square um, is is perfect at 6.34 a.m., but it's important here to also recognize that Venus is making a square and a half to Mars, while Mars is making a square and a half back to Saturn. Venus, Saturn, and Mars are making what we call Thor's hammer, or sometimes called an iron yod, because Venus square Saturn is like the base of that Yod pointing to Mars um, toward the end of of Cancer, which is thankfully trining um, trining Neptune, but 
this is a complicated energy because it's almost like the Venus square Saturn says we can't have something we want. It's almost like we're we have this obstacle, we have these situations we got to deal with, and and yet it those two energies combine and they want the energy to come out through the apex, through the the point in that pyramid or triangle through Mars, and yet Mars is in Cancer, which in some ways makes it more cautious, more internalized, and at the same time Mars is forming that trine with Neptune, which is going to dreams and imagination. We also have here on the 28th, um, we also have the sun making a square and a half to Jupiter. This is again about overdoing overconfidence. It's almost like we the energy here has potential for going too much, too far in so many different directions. It's hard really to, um, to say what will happen, um, especially since the moon um, moving through the latter degrees of Virgo um, midday on the 28th. Um, on Monday makes a trine to Uranus, even stimulating that action more. It then makes a trine to um, to Pluto. Um, and by later in the evening today, on Monday the 28th, the moon actually moves out of Virgo into Libra. But as it does so, it kind of completes that grand Earth trine. And again, the move, the movement from Earth into air is something that we've talked about before. We talked about it at the beginning of the month, and we're talking about it again. Um, and um, these are complicated energies. Um, and of course, it's not lost that on me that talking about this almost a month in advance, we're also coming up day by day toward the presidential election here in the United States. I'm going to drill down on this energy a lot deeper in the mid-month update that will come out around the, the, the middle of October, give or take a few days. But as we get close to the end of the month, we also have Mars not only moving um, toward the opposition um, to, um, to Pluto, um, but it's also, which it doesn't reach until November, just prior to the election. In fact, the exact Mars-Pluto opposition um, occurs um, on, on November 3rd, um, uh, um, which is just crazy close to the election, the um, power, the contention, the the energy that is, the power plays that are going on is just, I mean, it's, it's almost beyond words. But, but here, back on the 28th um, into the 29th, um, we have Saturn also uh, be... Mars um, it making that square and a half to Saturn coming into the opposition to Pluto. Um, this is really difficult energy. Um, on the 29th, the Mars is exactly sesquisquare to Saturn. At the same time, Venus, which is, remember, Venus um, was square to Saturn, and it is now exactly half square to Pluto. And again, <clears throat> This energy aimed at Pluto is really, really powerful because of Mars is coming into the opposition to Pluto. We have, in effect, a Thor's hammer or iron yod with Pluto at the action point halfway between um, the square between um, um, between Venus and and Saturn. Um, and that square, of course, was exact yesterday on the 28th, but we can see how potent it is now as Mars is still um, a square and a half to, to Saturn. Um, and Venus is exactly a half square um, to, um, to Pluto. And then by the 30th, we have um, the Mercury's exact opposition to Uranus. Again, the words, the language. I mean, we're stretched here to the max. We have the moon having moved into Libra. It did that on Monday evening. Um, and on Monday evening at 929, the moon moved in, into Libra. And here on the, um, on the 30th, we can see that the 
Um, um, on, the, on the 30th, the moon is opposing Chiron. We can see that Mercury is opposing Uranus, and we can see that Mars is opposing Pluto, even though it's not quite exact yet. There's tension, tension in the air, and it's coming from every direction. That's on the 30th. And that Mercury opposition Uranus is, again, it's about saying things that are just, it, it, it's almost saying things that can just stir up more energy than than it, than it um, intends. And then by the 31st, we have now Mercury moving into that trine with um, uh, with Neptune. And, you know, uh, Mars is moving um, away from the trine, but we have a grand water trine. Um, during this period of time, we're coming into the new moon. The new moon is exact on the 1st of November, um, but this new moon is incredibly potent. Um, and we'll have more to say about that on the mid-month update. And even the um, November forecast will start off, I'm sure, with a look at the new moon that is exact on uh, the morning of November 1st. That's it. It's a rock and roll month. I'm not even sure what else to say um, other than you. it's what we'd expect coming into this particular presidential election. Things are not going to settle down. They're not going to settle down easily. They're not going to go away. We need to pay attention. We need to do our best to keep opening our minds, to widen our perspectives. The more resistance we have to the truth, the more difficult the outcome will be. We have to pay attention to what's going on, not what we've been told, not what we thought was true, not what we want to believe, but we need to pay attention to the facts. The facts will get us through this, and if we can get through this, by all the astrology I know, by 2025, 26, 27, we're going to be out of this mess. Right now, we are at the brink. We are at the edge. And, and, and it's more important than ever that we restrain that Mars, but not deny it. Remember, denial of Mars, of assertion, of anger, of rage, denial of Mars, especially while it's moving through, through cancer, through the latter degrees of cancer, this can turn into action that has no use, in fact, can be very detrimental. Remember, Mars moves into Leo um, in early November, and once it does, then we'll begin to actually take action on things. Even though Mars will turn retrograde and we're not quite done with what's going on now, we have the potential for turning things around and making things positive. It doesn't take away the fact that things right now are on the brink. They're on the edge. We're on a cusp. We're not on a cusp between two signs. We're on a cusp between two ways of being in the world. And I don't mean individually, although it all starts with individual, individuality. I mean as a species, as a, as, a, uh, as a culture, as a family, as a community, as a tribe, as a nationality. Um, we are on the edge between what we were and what we will be. And it's more important than ever to think cosmically but to act locally. Be kind, be considerate, be aware, be safe. I'm Rick Levine.